solution for an inclusive public input process for developing recommendations tailored to the students that attend the schools in those communities. I want to thank everyone that has been involved with this bill, in, including education leaders in my district who have been leaders on this issue for decades. I want to thank in particular CEC1 President Naomi Pena, uh, former CEC1 member Lisa Donlin, uh, current member uh, Marco Battistella, who's a member of CEC1 School Diversity Advisory Group, former CEC2 President Robin Broshi, and CEC2 Diversity Committee Co-Chair Shino Tanakawa for her crucial input. And I want to thank the entire team at the council who worked in this legislation, including, of course, Legislative Council, uh, Malcolm Butehorn, Jason Goldman, and my staff, including Katie Loeb and Jeremy Unger. Thank you all for your support. We have a lot of work to do for our schools, very large school system, most segregated one in the country, and I'm looking forward to working with everybody to move this issue forward. Thank you. We also have an education bill and two pieces of housing legislation sponsored by public advocate Jumani Williams that the council will be voting on today. First, introduction number 1550A, sponsored by the public advocate, would codify the school diversity advisory group into law, the SDAG. The SDAG was established in 2017 by the mayor and the New York City Department of Education as part of their diversity in New York City public schools plan and it was designed to make formal policy recommendations to the mayor and chancellor relating to increasing diversity in schools. This bill will ensure that this work continues in the future. The membership of the advisory group will now include speaker appointments, a public advocate appointment, in addition to the mayoral appointments that already exist. The advisory group will be tasked with examining all factors as they relate to school diversity and will be required on an annual basis to provide a public report to the mayor and speaker on increasing diversity in all of our schools. The annual report would also require the department to report on prior recommendations as adopted and share information on its implementation efforts going forward. Next, by, uh, uh, by Public Advocate Williams, is Introduction 716A, which would require the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, to annually report on certain information regarding waiting lists of Mitchell Lama housing developments, including the number of people who were skipped and the number of complaints received about Mitchell Lama waiting lists. And finally, for the Public Advocate, Introduction uh, Number 720C, which would allow not-for-profit organizations with at least three years of construction-related workforce development or training experience to apply the Department of Buildings for approval. The site safety training must be conducted by a person who is certified to teach OSHA 10 or 30 hour, OSHA 10 or 30-hour courses. This bill would also update the definition of a quote competent person to clarify which competent persons require site safety training supervisor cards and finally this bill would amend existing reporting requirements regarding the number of site safety training providers i want to thank the public advocate for his work on these three pieces of legislation next the council has two additional pieces of housing legislation introduced by council members traeger and levine introduction number 564a sponsored by councilmember mark traeger would require the department of housing preservation and development to report on housing lottery outcomes hpd would be required to report on applicant race or ethnicity and applicant preference category at the citywide and borough-wide levels and on applicant household size and applicant household income at the city, borough, and community district levels. In addition to reporting on applicant demographic information, HPD would also be required to report on the number of applicants who applied for affordable housing units, the number of applicants who were selected for affordable housing units, and the number of applicants who signed leases for affordable housing units. And I would invite Mark to come up and speak on this bill. Which Mark? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the passage of Introduction 564A, we will finally know exactly who qualifies for affordable housing, who does not, and why. This bill will help shed light on the demand for affordable housing units in New York City and create transparency for residents who apply to the affordable housing lottery and the number of applicants who sign leases for affordable housing units in the city. My colleagues and I heard from many who are being rejected for unclear reasons than those who are winning the lottery. We'd like to know what is working and what is not working, and to finally answer the question, affordable for who? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Mark. And 
Uh, next is Introduction 550A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Levine, which would require the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to report on housing lottery, the housing lottery process, including complaints about housing lotteries, planned improvements to housing lotteries, and housing lottery methodologies. Additional reporting would provide will provide needed transparency on the selection process and information about the demographics of applicants who are accepted for and move into these units. And I invite. Mark to come up and speak on this bill. <laughs> Entirely too many marks in this body. Uh, the, the, the HPD lottery is, is higher stakes than ever now, not only because of how desperate people are for housing, but we're getting 70,000 applicants or more on every project. Uh, so these lotteries are just, they're, they're, they're really intense and they're competitive and people's lives are at stake. Um, they need to be flawless and they're not. There are all sorts of inconsistencies in the way uh, people are selected from project to project. Uh, it's often opaque criteria. You can have two applicants with the same income and the same family structure that on the same project get uh, different answers to questions about qualification. Um, even more uh, uncertainty about how waiting lists are administered, uh, inconsistencies about how we treat paper applicants versus online applicants. Um, and we are putting this forward, putting forward this legislation, Intro 550, um, to try and rectify this by requiring HPD to report on all the protocols on, on how they qualify people for and administer these, lobby, these uh, lotteries, uh, how they populate and manage waiting lists, um, how they're gonna deal with paper applications as they're moving more intensely to uh, entirely online. Uh, process. Um, we want people to have confidence that these lotteries are done in a fair, consistent, transparent way, and we think that um, these reporting requirements uh, will help achieve that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your support, and thanks to my colleagues. Thanks, Mr. Mark. And the council will be voting on a very important piece of legislation that expands prevailing wage protections to more building service workers. This bill will help set many more workers on a solid path to the middle class. Good paying jobs in the city are uh, sadly few and far between and we look at this bill as an investment in our future. Introduction 1321C, sponsored by Councilman Rafael Espinal, would remove the current exemption in the existing prevailing wage law, Local Law 27 of 2012, for affordable housing projects and not-for-profit developers of residential product projects. Local Law 27 of 2012 requires building service workers to be paid the prevailing wages in buildings where the developer receives at least $1 million in discretionary financial assistance from the city or a city economic development entity. Accordingly, building service workers in most residential projects receiving financial assistance of more than a million dollars for new construction or, pr or preservation would be required to, to, be pay to pay the prevailing wage. This bill uh, has some exemptions. It exempts smaller residential projects with fewer than 120 units, certain supportive housing projects, deeply affordable preservation projects, and NYCHA projects financed through the Federal Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, the RAD program. And I invite Rafael to come up and speak on this important bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's no secret the cost of living in the city is out of reach for many. And you know, just one financial setback, like a medical emergency, can leave a family not being able to make rent or afford to eat. And in response to this crisis, we've uh, built a lot of affordable housing, working uh, here in the council and with the mayor. Uh, but, however, until today, the people who work in these buildings that are built could be paid as low as the minimum wage with no benefits. The bill we are voting will end this deb debilitating contradiction by requiring these workers to be paid a prevailing wage. My district is facing a housing crisis just like the rest of the city, and this crisis has to be addressed not just by looking at how much affordable housing is available, but by examining what kind of jobs are available as well. During the East New York rezoning, we struck this balance by building 100% affordable housing and ensure that all of the building workers that were going to work in that housing in my district will be paid a prevailing wage. So if we can do it in East New York, we can do this citywide. Good jobs should be the cornerstone of our strategy as we look to make New York City a place where working families can thrive. I'm grateful for the tireless advocacy that got us to where we are today. We spoke with workers, 
and we heard firsthand we heard from them their firsthand accounts of living on the brink of poverty, and we worked with housing advocates to discuss how to make the city a more affordable place to live. This bill reflects a lot of conversations and negotiations. I really want to thank uh, the speaker, his team, Rob Newman, uh, who's been outstanding in getting this bill pushed. We're going to miss you, uh, but I'm and I'm proud of the balance we struck and eager to implement a law that ensures that whenever we build good housing, we build good jobs too. Thank you. Thanks, Rafael. And finally. Today, the council is voting on what I believe is a revolutionary package of legislation that will make Hart Island, also known as the city's potter's field, a more respectful resting place for the estimated one million people who are buried there. Since 1869, Hart Island has been used as New York City's public burial ground. Visiting Hart Island can feel like visiting a prison. I know, I've been there, I visited uh, just about a year ago, I think it was in December of last year, and it was uh, very moving to visit, sad in many ways to visit, to see what the conditions are like at Hart Island and how it is really sealed off and closed off from family members and the public who rightfully want to visit uh, people who uh, have been buried there, how we treat people who have come before us says a lot about who we are as a society. Uh, many of the people buried in Hart Island were people who were marginalized when they were living. The very poor immigrants with no family in this country, AIDS victims who were shunned at the heights of the HIV and AIDS epidemic. And today, I believe we are taking Hart Island back. A final resting place should not be run by the Department of Correction, and we're making that official today. I want to thank Melinda Hunt, who is here, who has done an incredible job for so many years at shining a light on what's been happening on Hart Island, and to partner with her has been a really extraordinary. So today is in large part because of Melinda's advocacy and the people who she has worked with over the years, and I really want to thank her for her hard work. And I want to thank Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez, who has been a champion on this introduction, 906A. He's worked with Melinda quite a bit. He'll talk about her. Uh, his bill would transfer jurisdiction and control over Hart Island from the Department of Correction to the Department of Parks and Recreation. Burials would be allowed to continue pursuant to rules and regulations established by the Department of Social Services uh, and the Parks Department. And we also have another bill by Councilmember Rodriguez, Introduction 909B, which would require the Department of Transportation or another agency designated by the mayor to develop a transportation plan for public travel, including ferry service to and from Hart Island. This bill requires consideration of multiple departure locations and factors such as changing conditions and future uses of Hart Island. The agency would have to submit a report on its plan and post the report on its website within one year of the bill's effective date. And lastly, I just want to say, when I visited Hart Island about a year ago, I went to the section of Hart Island where uh, basically everyone who had died from uh, AIDS uh, was placed on the island separate from other people, which is really crazy because once you're dead, you can't give another person AIDS, but it shows what was happening at the height of the epidemic. It's the largest cemetery of AIDS victims in the world, we believe. And for too long, it has been closed off from people who have wanted to visit their loved ones. Right now, when you go to Hart Island, if you're a loved one, you can basically only go once a week, and you have to stop a few feet from the ferry, standing at a gazebo, not able to go to the place where your loved one was actually buried. Um, and so it is time to change that. It is time to actually have this be a place where the public and where family members can go and visit and understand the history and pay respects to people that we lost. Uh, I, I also want to say that the Department of Correction, I think the, the women and men who were working on Hart Island were good people and were people that really cared about Hart Island, so this is not an indictment of them. The captain that showed us around that day cared very much about what happened on Hart Island, but we think that this is uh, really uh, just anachronistic and it is time to actually have a different agency be in charge of Hart Island. So I want to call up Councilman Rodriguez and thank him for his leadership on this important bill. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I would like also to ask the member of the veteran community, if you don't mind, to please sit here close to, to Melinda. And, you know, as a social study teacher that I was, there's one thing that we can do in the do now, which is who has not been buried in the public cemetery? 
And the answer is clear. The wealthy class has not been wealthy in that site. A million bodies been buried in that location. They are black because the cemetery started working in 1969, a ball from the Hunter family for $75,000. And from 1969, he started working. White people who were died during the Civil War, they didn't want to be buried together with black people. So they brought those bodies to that public cemetery. That site is an interesting place to also look at it. Because look at that son, he had been used for multiple, pur multiple purposes. Missile, during the Cold War, they have been different use. And it's a place, probably historian, they need to look at it and see what has happened in Hart Island. Who has been buried there? Immigrants like myself, those who today, they don't have a $4,000 to pay for a funeral because through HRA, we provide assistance to family, a family that they have lost a family member and they need help to cover the funeral expense. But we only provide 1,200. That's how much we provide as support to, to poor family that they need to, that need help to put their loved one in a funeral. No funeral will cost 200, three, 4,000, 5,000. So this is the working class. This is the immigrants. This is, as you say, when we walk by, you know, back in December, and I know how compassion, you know, how much you were touched, be in the site where the men and women, they were dying through HIV, and, and you know, the, it was a tough time. Like where people thought that if I get close to someone who died from HIV, I would be also getting the illness. Not even the people were donating the clothing and no one was taking it. So for me, you know, this is a day where everyone, all of us should be proud. We are writing a new chapter in the New York City history. Transfer the location where the largest public cemetery in the United States of America has been closed. It was in 2014 that Elizabeth Crowley, she tried, she pushed, and the Melinda and the foundation, they brought a lawsuit. Backward to 2014, not even with those restrictions, we, the more progressive city in New York, were allowing New Yorkers and visitors to go and connect in a special moment, visiting someone that you had lost. So as a person of faith, Catholic, empowered Christian community, I know how important it is to visit a loved one. You know, my, pastor, my father passed away in 2009. I did a swearing in his apartment in El Barrio. But when I go to DR, it is important for me to spend some time where his body has been buried. We've been denying that for 150 years. And it is now what we're saying we would like to live progressive. We are opening the cemetery, not only transferred from correctional to park, but also we are mandating DOT to put together a plan. If you want to visit a governor's island, yes, you only need to find out the scheduling. How often do the boats go to governor's island? They used to have a ferry going from the Bellevue Hospital in that area to Hart Island to bring the body there. So we already have done in the past, having different destination. It's not only from City Island that visitors should be able to go to Hard Island. We can you know, create multiple destinations. So when I met with the Garifuno community from Honduras, and they said this is important for us to visit the loved one. When I met with the Afro-American community, with the working class community, with the Nigerian community, and they say, we would like to be able to visit a loved one being buried that location. Then I had no doubt, the speaker, that even though I was told that the city could not do this, because this is what we have seen in your leadership, 
you know, as someone that I put language to, to do, do this thing in the past, and I was told the city of New York cannot do that. But it was the same thing that I was told when I put language in 2010 about closing Rikers Island. I was told that the city of New York could not do this. The same thing that I was told when I established, when I tried to push a fair fair, and I was told the city of New York cannot do this. So three major things have been done, you know, so important. And for me, all I can say is keep working your leadership, keep, let's keep working together to the bettering. You know, this is very important. Importante, hoy estamos abriendo el cementerio público, el más grande de la nación, donde están enterrados inmigrantes pobres para que la persona lo puedan visitar y hacerlo con dignidad. Thank you. Next introduction, 1580A, sponsored by Council Member uh, Debbie Rose, would require a hearing on the public burial process, which would allow the public the opportunity to discuss the laws, rules, regulations, policies, and procedures related to public burials. This bill would require the Department of Social Services to submit a report summarizing and responding to comments received at the hearing by 2020, and I invite Debbie to come up and speak on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon. More than one million people are buried at Hart Island. Most of them remain nameless. But to someone, each of these individuals was a child, a parent, a friend, or a neighbor. The bodies of the deceased are placed in pine boxes marked by a black magic marker, that a permanent marker, and they are stacked three deep in a trench with up to 162 adults and 1,000 infants per trench. This is not a dignified burial. Visitors to Heart Island must get permission to visit their loved one's final resting place at Heart Island based on a monthly schedule, which is determined by the Department of Corrections. And I've visited many cemeteries across the city, and I know that this is a deeply personal moment one of prayer, reflection, and permanent re uh, personal reminiscing. And I just can't imagine going through this process with strangers or on someone else's schedule and in front of an unmarked trench. Our current process could not be more impersonal. This process does not reflect who we are or who we strive to be as New Yorkers. As a Staten Islander, I allocate discretionary funds every year to ensure that no North Shore residents are sent to an unmarked grave and that they are buried in a grave with dignity and compassion. But that is not the case throughout the city. Today we will vote on intro 1580A, which will require a public hearing on this topic, which will be convened by the Department of Social Services and attended by the various government stakeholders like the Department of Corrections, Parks, Health and Mental Hygiene, Medical Examiner, and others. Advocates, families, and the general public will each have the opportunity to discuss the policies that are related to our public burial policy, including the process of finding, notifying, and communicating next of kin the Department of Social Services Burial Assistance Program, the feasibility of implementing a cremation assistance program, or proving cremation as an alternative, the feasibility of public burial in a site other than Hart Island, the public will, and others, the public will be encouraged to recommend changes to our policies and alternative programs. And following the hearing, the Department of Social Services will be required to submit a report with recommendations to the mayor and the city council. Shining a light on this issue is the first step toward changing it. My hope is that the final report will lead to policies where every New York City resident without means for a private burial is laid to rest with dignity and respect in a recorded space that can be found and visited in personal moments, in peace, comfort, and tranquility. I really want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson, not just for his leadership, but for his compassion and his um, devotion to looking out for those of us who are less fortunate. I want to thank Chair Levine for hearing this, 
this um, important bill and for his advocacy. I also want to thank Sarah Liss and my legislative team for their hard work on this bill. Thank you. Introduction number 1559 is sponsored by Councilmember Diana Ayala and it would require the Department of Social Services to establish an office that provides assistance to individuals who have lost a loved one and need information about getting them a public burial, obtaining a burial allowance, or learning about a similar program. This office would provide services including explaining the option of public burial and providing help in applying for a burial allowance and I want to congratulate Councilmember Ayala on this. I want to thank a lot of bills today and I want to thank all the staff who's here for their incredible hard work in making all of this happen. Thank you all very, very much and I'm happy to now take any on-topic questions. Uh, yeah, Courtney. No, that's not the plan. Do, do you want to talk about it, Adonis? We don't want no correctional should be involved of running a cemetery. Most park, most cemetery in the nation, they are on the park. Those who are the public one. So the answer is no. And Blackburn Bill that we just you don't think so, Melinda? No. Okay. <laughs> Melinda would know. <laughs> They're not. They, I don't know. They said within the next like five to seven years that they're going to be running out of space and it's like it's time to assess how we do these kinds of burial space on a really big scale so we can't kind of just change the I know that San Francisco is like pretty close to that. I know that it's just time to consider something like that instead of having a public burial like that that can get people to do I think there'll be a process to have those conversations, but the first step was actually to move it away from the Department of Corrections and to make sure it's a less restrictive place to actually get people onto the island, see what's going on there, make some investments into the island. Right now the island has a bunch of abandoned buildings. Uh, the shoreline, if there's a major storm or a nor'easter, there are literally um, uh, bones that uh, show up sometimes and so we want to make sure that the resiliency work is done to protect the people who have been buried on the island make sure it continues to be a place uh, where they're respected and then the longer conversation uh, if there is a time one day where the island is going to be full we could have a conversation about what are other proper places to actually do that but this has been, as you heard from Councilmember Rodriguez and Rose and Melinda can tell you, this has been a long process. I think the last three mayors have sort of punted on not wanting to handle this and through a lot of grit and tenacity, hard work from the council members and from the advocates, we finally got to this good place today. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Adonis and Debbie. Yeah, what is the date? And they, it's 21, right? Is that a 20? 2021. 21. So, I, I, you know, as I said before, like, first of all, that build that, that site has like seven buildings that, you know, they had to be turned down. Like, they are, a, those are not in good condition right now. So, when it comes to if we would like to see us potential to expand, say there's space there. But we would like, you know, to create a better condition, as I said before, why we send the poor, the, the individual that they are the immigrant, the poorest one, to be buried in that location, when we also should be able to increase the support to those families that they don't have all the resources. You know, one of the challenges that we have, as I say, is that through HRA, the family that they need help to bury their loved one, they only get $1,200. That's how much they qualify to. So if we are able to increase the, the assistance to those families, then a large number of them, they would not have to be buried in that location. And um, intro 1580A um, addresses many of the questions that you have, Courtney, um, in terms of the, um, the meeting. That is the purpose of the public hearing to determine, um, uh, look at alternatives, maybe create um, cremation, alternative sites, and um, to address all of the issues that um, not only you brought up here, but my colleagues have discussed. Yeah, Joe. Um, just for the resiliency, could you 
Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, how much time do we have? I mean, it's such a it's a big it's such a big issue, and I think the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project is a really important step given the devastation that we saw on the night that Sandy hit with the Con Ed plant being overwhelmed with water, which set the cascade effect. And you saw multiple hospitals that were underwater on the east side and public housing developments that took months to recover. So this is a really important project that we really shouldn't uh, underestimate uh, in any way. I think the larger question on resiliency and if we are doing enough, you know, if another storm hit today or another storm hit next year, there are still gonna be lots of places in New York City that are significantly underwater. And so, you know, seven years, a little more than seven years after Sandy hit, uh, places like uh, Red Hook and Eastern Queens and Coney Island uh, and Staten Island, uh, you know, the, the East Shore of Staten Island, you know, there are places that still, there would be major, major problems. Now, you know, the, the, the city, needs to be doing more proactively on our own. But this issue of climate change and resiliency is also an issue that we really need federal participation in um, and state participation in because the cost is so enormous. It is billions and billions and billions of dollars that to have a good federal partner, whether it's the Army Corps of Engineers or the environmental agencies at the federal and state level is enormously important. So, you know, we saw earlier this year, actually during the summer, when there was just torrential rain, what happened in certain places across the city that were underwater in Brooklyn and in Queens, that was just torrential rain over the course of hours. It wasn't even a significant storm event. So, I mean, I still think there's an enormous amount of work to do, but this project is a great first step. Yes. I'm not sure, let me just check. There, there's a current database, which has really been a, an advocate piecemeal-led database where they've cobbled all this information together, but on the official data database, are we, is that something that's gonna be part of this? Yes, it's already in there. Okay. Bridget? Um, you know, Councilor, I think this is a question more on like what the municipalities and states can do to really make these disasters like more invasive and such an easier thing. How what can the Forest Service actually do to make sure that they can follow through with this? So uh, let me see here. The um, you know, DOE has already started engaging in other uh, school districts. So we saw the desegregation plan that was community-led in District 15, and we've seen the results in a year on the desegregation that's happened there. How many other, there have been, what, six other districts that have opted in in that amount of time that on their own, even before we uh, codified this, uh, made this decision? Um, it's a requirement. So the Department of Education is going to have to do the outreach to the community education councils uh, and to the different groups that are uh, listed in this legislation, parents, teachers, principals, administrators, and they're gonna have to start engaging those folks. So they would be in violation of the law. I believe that we're not gonna have to push the DOE to do this because the DOE wants to do this work. Uh, they're the ones that initially sort of came up with a template of providing the money, I think it was two or three million dollars 
for uh, the community districts that wanted to opt in. So I'm not worried that they're gonna be in violation of this. What's more of a concern to me is that there may be communities that potentially don't want to engage in this. And that is why it's gonna be important for the Department of Education to engage with local stakeholders, uh, elected officials, the Community Education Council and others to talk about the benefits of this and to also say that there's not a one size fits all approach. It's not a cookie cutter approach. There are different things that can be looked at, admissions policy, transfer issues, all of the things that we detailed in the bill, those are the things. And the DOE needs to go out and, and, and really educate the local uh, communities on this. You know, one of the things that I think has really been lost in the conversation around specialized high schools, which is only 15,000 children out of 1.1 million school children and 300,000 high school students, only 15,000 seats and children, is that there are a lot of other really good high schools besides the specialized high schools. And the DOE has to do a better job of going out there and I don't know if the right word is marketing, but educating parents and communities on what are other good options besides specialized high schools. And we need to talk about what a student's full needs are. So I think that needs to be part of this entire conversation. Colleen, did you wanna add anything? And Brad? And I, I just want to add that we have been in communication with the administration on this throughout the entire kind of amending the bill and, and having conversations with some of the school leaders who have been working on this issue for a really long time. So they are already starting to organize around this and what we were trying to do with the bill was to also recognize, honor and respect all the work that has already been done. So there's some clear language in the bill that says for the, for the school districts that have had a group, we're making sure that we're learning from them to avoid any redundancies. And whenever the DOE comes to testify, they say that this kind of initiative is exactly in line with their goals. So now we just wanna make sure we get the CBO partner that people feel comfortable with. And I think what's really awesome about this group is that it also involves students. I'll just speak very quickly to Jumani's bill, which uh, codifies the School Diversity Advisory Group and then requires an annual report on its progress. So you saw, you know, they put out two reports, but then when was the mayor and the chancellor going to respond to them was a little vague. Now there will be an annual reporting requirement out of that body, which will also be established by law, not just for this administration, but going beyond it. And we will work with the Department of Education to oversee the implementation of these district diversity groups and on the SDAG as well. Will? Yeah, sure. On the, I know we were going to talk about the law, but uh, on the uh, prevailing wage bill, yes. uh, a number of public service providers and WPDs, public housing developers that come out of there, which bill was going out about triple what they said there were uh, on the, uh, you know, the wide swing of housing, uh, you know, and upon, you know, this is the operation of a lot of these uh, things. And then these firms, public service providers, and the argument also made is that this is going to exacerbate Uh, you know, we were really, I think, thoughtful in how we went about the exemptions that were put forward in this bill, and it was based on us talking with the advocate community, the developers, supportive housing developers, taking into consideration these issues, which is why uh, we wanted to ensure that 50% of uh, that, that the bill exempts supportive housing projects with certain regulatory agreements and uh, also homeless shelters, certain deeply affordable preservation pro projects. You see very um, a granular specificity in this bill based off of the communications we had with the different organizations that are doing this type of work. So I think that uh, it's a good balance. It's a balance that is going to raise the wages of people that uh, we hope are gonna make a middle class living and it's still gonna allow the opportunity for the city to continue to underwrite deals. Now we can underwrite deals with this baked into it, which means the city may have to put a little bit more subsidy into those deals, which will still keep them affordable while at the same time raise wages for people that we think have been underpaid for too long. Who's next? Jeff. Uh, on the instructor safety update. Uh, yes. 
Yes. Was that just too aggressive at, at first? Uh, the, the segregation hearing bill um, had to be changed so much. Uh, was it just poorly written? I, I want to. Uh, Carlos is not here. Menchaco is working on this, and neither is the public advocate. So, Jeff, I'm going to wing it, and you tell me if I get any of this wrong. Uh, I, I, I think the issue was that uh, we wanted more people to actually be able to get uh, site safety certified uh, to be able to do a certain amount of training on the importance of site safety work. And part of the, the issue here has been that we were looking to get more training for some people that have typically been left out. So who are some of those people? If you have day laborers or people where English is not their first language, uh, it was potentially harder to reach those people because they were not uh, going to and enrolling in typical programs that were doing the OSHA 10 hour, OSHA, thir OSHA 30 hour a week course. And so the point of this bill was to try to figure out a way that would um, get more people enrolled in doing this type of training, while at the exact same time trying to figure out if there was enough capacity to, uh, of organizations and groups that do this type of work, they could do this type of work in the right way, in a way that got it right, in a way that wasn't sort of too loose, uh, and where they knew exactly what they were doing. And that was the balance we've been trying to strike. Honestly, I wasn't really part of these negotiations. It was the public advocate and Councilman Menchaca who had been working with the organizations and the building trades on this. But I believe, Jeff, did I get that mostly right? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so I, think, I think that is sort of the path that got us here. Any, uh, yes. Hi. Um, so there's a school board member in Brooklyn who has done a lot of critical and uh, effective work with the American community. We're doing on topic now. Is oh, this an off topic? It's off topic. Let me just, yeah, be, yeah. any more on topic? Any more on topic? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so um, you know, in a listserv that's shared by different school leaders, so I've got a idea of like eliminating standardized testing, um, she referred to people in the Asian American community as yellow. I mean, it's hard for me to comment on this because I'm learning from it from you, and I, I, you're telling me, but I haven't read anything. I don't have verified information. I'm going to assume that it's all correct, and there may be more uh, information that I need to learn, but it, it's totally unacceptable. It's unacceptable to use that type of language to refer to uh, 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 one of the most important uh, parts of our city. Uh, the greatest part of New York City is its people and its diversity. 37% of New Yorkers, of the 8.6 million people who live in our great city, were not born in the United States of America, but came here with dreams and aspirations for themselves and for their families. And so to use that type of inflammatory, uh, racist, denigrating rhetoric is totally unacceptable. I'll say that generally without knowing the specifics of this case. Bob? Um, I know that under the administration, the city had more supportive uh, labor movement speakers in town. Could you speak to the growing fervor that's been documented by Chief Judge Rabbit, uh, aspirationally within the city council staff about getting some recognition of the union? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I uh, support unionization. So if the staff here at the city council uh, wants to take that step, I wholeheartedly support them. And uh, I want to make it as easy as possible for them to do that, uh, to engage with them. 
um, in uh, a way that's prescribed by law, because these things are prescribed by law, uh, to make sure that we do it properly and correctly. But I totally support their right to organize, and I think it's really important that they feel like collectively they'll have a voice to be able to weigh in on the myriad of employment issues, whether it's wages, whether it is workplace practices. So on that question, uh, I support their rights, and whenever they want to start that conversation with my general counsel and with the team here at the city council, we're more than willing to start those conversations, and I'm, I'm totally fine with that. On the issue of uh, pay disparity, I just want to say uh, a few things. Um, I'm really proud that for the part of the council that sort of I control as speaker, which is the central staff, that I set a minimum salary of $52,000 a year for all employees here that are full-time employees. So the, the, the lowest paid full-time employee here at the city council is $52,000. And I think that was something that previously never existed uh, in a previous council. So I'm really proud of that step. We've also, even though the current employees are not part of a union, we've been giving uh, COLA adjustments, cost of living adjustments, that are tied, that are set and patterned on the DC 37 uh, COLAs that are in place. I believe a COLA went into effect this week, actually, for staff here. Uh, so we've been doing that even though we haven't been required to. We've done that because we think it's a good labor practice to actually have uh, a scale that people know is going to be set for all salaries across the council. I'm really proud that one of the first things I did as speaker a little more uh, than a year and a half ago was we strengthened the maternity and paternity policies here at the council. I now believe we have the strongest and best maternity and paternity uh, policies of any agency in the entire city of New York. We strengthened our anti-harassment policies uh, in February of last year, both in the rules of the council and through legislation, where now if you're someone who witnesses sexual harassment or discrimination or retaliation and you don't report it, you are then culpable in some way yourself for not reporting it. And we hired an outside investigator, an independent prosecutor, to come in and take a look at two cases that involved uh, potential harassment, and then we deemed it harassment, with uh, Carrie Cohen, uh, someone who is very experienced and that showed a level of independence and credibility in those investigations. And lastly, we hired Redwood Enterprises, a nationally known firm that was going to come in and audit us as a body to look at our sexual harassment policies, our anti-discrimination policies, all of the workplace policies that we have. Those were all proactive things that we've done. But I really want to, to say and stress, and I said this to New York One uh, a couple of weeks ago when uh, that letter was sent uh, to me and to other council members about the atmosphere here at the council. I hear them, and we are not perfect and I want to do better. So if there are other ways that we can do better, if that means uh, coming up with a potential minimum salary for all staff members, even if they're not on central staff, that's something I'm open to looking at. If that means that we need to uh, strengthen some of the policies that uh, are in place but don't go far enough, I'm open to looking at that. And that could be a conversation that we could have with a potential bargaining unit uh, when they do begin to organize, and hopefully we're gonna get recommendations from Redwood Enterprises, who is doing a top to bottom audit on us to say, here are things you could do to actually be stronger in these areas. So that's some context on what we've done. Uh, I support the efforts to unionize, and I'm open to looking at other areas where we can potentially bring more uniformity and to strengthen policies we currently have. No, I mean, because I think uh, that we were doing, we were basically doing a lot of this anyway. I mean, some of the things we were doing go goes beyond the private sector. In the private sector, they don't set a minimum salary. We set a minimum salary here at the city council. So we did that because we wanted people to make more money and to, and to not feel exploited. Um, and I, I think that uh, our maternity and paternity leave policy is much stronger than the private but sector.
Yeah. Well, no. And you give them a certain amount of money, and it's up to them like a small business, right? Would you have to change that? What's it's, that mechanism? It's a little complicated. So historically, long predating my time as speaker, long predating my time ever be electing to the city council over the course of probably every previous speaker that's ever served here in the body, there has been uh, a system that's set up where the speaker of the city council uh, oversees the central staff of the council, the legislative division, the land use division, the administrative staff, the general counsel's office, the finance staff, but the members, as you pointed out, Bob, have autonomy on hiring and also autonomy on what they pay their staff. But there's a little bit of a mix here in some ways because the uh, employment policies of the city council, whether it's our sexual harassment policies, our anti-discrimination policies, our maternity and paternity policies, our vacation policies, those are all central and they apply to everyone. <laughs> Always have to set the, uh, the salaries on their, uh, on the people that work in their district offices and in their legislative office. And uh, they get to decide with that lump sum of money that's given to them every year, how much they're gonna spend on rent, how much they're gonna spend to pay their staff. So that, that divide has always been there. To have a conversation about minimum salaries for all staff members here at the city council is a, a little tricky in some ways. And it's a little tricky, I think, because um, the, I'm using this as an example. The way Councilmember Traeger runs his office may be totally different than the way Council Rosenthal runs her office, and they both may be totally successful models on how to run your office. And if we come in and basically say, you have to do it in this uniform way, it may not work potentially for Councilmember Rosenthal in the same way it works for Councilmember Traeger. So it's a balancing act. We wanna try to get this right. We wanna make sure that staff are being paid adequately and appropriately and fairly, while at the same time not take total discretion away of how members run their offices. So it's that balancing act that we're trying to figure out right now in a way that protects employees while at the same time doesn't totally remove autonomy from members on how they run their offices. Uh, Shant. Yeah, this is Peter. If I could ask a question. Yes. Um, Well, uh, Councilmember Chin just left, and it's it, it, it's it's it, it's in her district, um, and I want to hear from her because we haven't talked about it. Honestly, with all the back and forth on this recently, I'm not sure what really facilitated this. Um, I personally like where the statue is right now. I was really sad to see uh, about a month and a half ago when the statue was attacked and vandalized uh, by someone. Um, maybe that has something to do with why they're looking to move it, or maybe it's because the intersection splits uh, right there and potentially it's a dangerous place. But, you know, I think it's a good spot. If there are good reasons to move it, I'm open to hearing those. On um, the uh, on the business bill uh, on rent, I'm happy to have Councilmember Levin speak on it. My own personal feeling is it has to go through the legislative process. He and I haven't had the conversation to sit and talk and look at the bill, but I do think that we have a commercial vacancy crisis in New York City. Uh, I think there are a variety of factors of why that crisis exists. I think rent is one of those factors. There are other factors as well, such as property taxes with a broken property tax system, online retailers, and it sort of uh, diverges and, and uh, from area from different parts of the city. So the way uh, commercial vacancies uh, are in Soho might be different than the way they are in Soundview. And we want to craft a policy that looks at the entire need of the city, and I look forward to working with Steve on looking what that's like. I'll, I'll just say this is the beginning of the legislative process. I mean, we're just introducing the bill now, so we look forward to uh, talking to council members about and community groups about um, what they think about the bill, and obviously look, uh, speaking it over with the speaker in the speaker's office. Um, and you know, hopefully, we'll get to a hearing at some point, and we'll go from there. Yeah.
this well, this this bill, uh, Councilmember Levin's bill, is different than the Small Business Job Survival Act bill, which is Councilmember Rodriguez's bill, and they may need to actually sit down and have a conversation together because I think both of their bills are seeking the same goal, which is mm -hmm. figuring out the rent issue as it uh, as, as it pertains to um, small businesses. And so those two bills are different, but that, but what I said uh, before stands, which is if we're going to do something on commercial rents, we don't need to be helping gigantic companies, conglomerates. Uh, the real thing I think that where the crisis exists are mom and pop stores across New York City. When you lose a local bodega, when you lose a local butcher, when you lose a shoe repair store, when you lose these local small businesses that have been in the community a long time because of unfair rent hikes, you start to lose the fabric of New York City. And if there is a way for us to look at that responsibly, I am open to that, but I would never want to do anything that's going to help Goldman Sachs and WeWork. We need to be helping these smaller mom and pop shops that actually are struggling to get by with all of the different factors I mentioned, rent, property taxes, online retailers, all of these things. Something uh, I'd like to add on that is that the, the bill specifies that for retail space, it's uh, 10,000 square feet or below, um, light manufacturing space, 25,000 square feet or below, and uh, other types of offices, 10,000 square feet or below. So larger spaces or multi-floor um, you know, uh, office spaces, it would not apply to. Joe? Um, I was wondering if you had an opinion about what the amendment passed is going towards about selling clothes or you know, actually lifting the cap in terms of the fee or the lift rate. I support lifting uh, the vendor cap, but I think we need to be thoughtful about how we do it. And I think that enforcement on vending issues should be civilian enforcement, not uh, NYPD uniformed enforcement. Right now, if someone is uh, illegally vending, the people that show up are the NYPD. And part of the, I believe, uh, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that part of the Councilmember Chin's bill, which looks at uh, lifting the vending cap in New York City, would create a dedicated civilian unit uh, on enforcement that uh, does this type of vending enforcement and also looks at potential parts of the city where it wouldn't be smart to have vending. So on very, very busy uh, corners and places like on 42nd Street where potentially it's dangerous to have vending and in other places that we deem it doesn't work. So I support lifting the cap, uh, but I want to do it uh, responsibly. I want to make sure that we, we actually think about the entire city uh, when we do this because I think there are plenty of places in the city where vending would really work, where it currently is not allowed, and then there are some places in the city where it currently is allowed where it probably doesn't work. The system is totally broken. The cap has not been lifted since Ed Koch was mayor, which shows what a, a political hot potato this has been for so long that no one has really taken a look at it, and I think we have been looking at it. My team has been working on this with Councilmember Chin. We're going to continue to engage in those discussions. Yeah. Uh, we do not have authority uh, in the subway stations. That's governed by MTA state law rules, I believe. And on the actual cap itself, I support increasing the cap, but not unlimited, but actually, as the bill uh, uh, outlines, there would be a certain increase per year, every year, to get the cap up significantly and bring the waiting list down that is currently years long. Just as a follow-up, the mayor talked about this today at the press conference. Yep.
Uh, I can't remember the last time I had a conversation with the mayor about this. I think we talked about it in passing once, not uh, in a very serious way or in a granular way, looking at the legislative language inside Councilmember Chin's uh, bill. Uh, but I do think, you know, part of what I'm really proud of all of the members that are standing here and the ones that aren't here is that over the last almost two years, we've taken on a variety of issues that people said were really impossible to get done, whether it was us regulating for hire vehicles and became the first city in the United States to do it, whether it was us closing Rikers Island. There's been a variety of measures that have been really difficult, somewhat painful, incredibly complicated, closing hard, uh, transferring the jurisdiction of Hart Island, all of these things which have taken a lot of work, we've gotten there and we figured out a way forward. And I think there's a way forward on the vending issue, uh, but I wanna make sure that we, uh, that I don't wanna uh, in any way, um, uh, uh, I want to talk with Councilmember Chen, who has been working really, really hard on this for a long time with the Street Vendor Project and with other advocates on this. And I think it's important to have a conversation with her. But uh, I think we can get through this, but I want to do it in the right way. The system is so broken currently in so many ways where vending is allowed, where it's not allowed, the cap itself, the underground market that exists, mm -hmm. all of who's enforcing all of these things that to put all of that in one package and to get it all done in a way that would hopefully have some level of consensus, I think is the, it shows why no one has ever done it. So are you guaranteeing by the time you get done with street vendor that you sometime have the reform? I don't make guarantees, but I, but I think that uh, you heard from me a real willingness to actually look at this and work on this and try to get something done in a meaningful way. And this, we're going to end with Jeff. Uh, Great. Uh, I know <laughs> Great. The, the new Staten Island flag, you used to have the old one. Was that changed recently? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I honestly, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. It could be Joe Borelli snuck in here. Uh, <laughs> And would have stolen it. Uh, it might be the that might be the secession flag. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Thanks.